So hi, I'm here to talk about the pain points in the purchase to pay process. And actually that is quite appropriate since I'm going to use a whiteboard instead of any kind of automatic, flashy, electronic things. Because that's basically what this is about. But in order to talk about the pain points in the purchase to pay process, we should actually start from the other end. So let's talk about returns. Free returns in fashion online retail is a commodity today, partially actually created by Zalando. 50% of the consumers who buy fashion online say they would never buy anything at all online unless there were free returns. 25% of all fashion bought online in the UK is actually being returned. In Germany, that number is staggering 70% of the fashion bought online. 70%. 30% of the consumers who buy fashion online um, deliberately over-order with a clear intent to return. So hence, instead of buying that pair of jeans that you want to have, they buy three and they return two. Or the same thing of shoes, of course. 50% of the returns that we get are actually because the clothes do not fit. They don't sit right. And 22% of the returns in fashion is because the clothes that you get in your package home doesn't look as it did on the website. Now, we can clearly see that we have got a problem here. And the problem is that we have no standards. Basically, we have no standards. And also, clothes is actually not very suitable to buy online in all honesty, because it's a very difficult product to buy. So, sizes are a big problem, because there are no standards. You also see that between different regions in the world, right? So you've got UK sizes, you've got European sizes, you've got Japanese sizes, you've got Italian sizes, you've got US sizes. They may look the same, but they actually mean completely different things. Colors are extremely difficult to reproduce on a screen. You can see that for yourself. You can look at your smartphone and then you look at your laptop and the colors will look different, also depending on the light and stuff. The pictures may not actually represent exactly how the clothes look. I mean, you also see this if you go to the high street retailers and you actually go shop online, offline, that very often you see this really nice slim fit t-shirt and then you turn the mannequin and you see that they've actually put things there in order to make it look nicer on the on the uh, mannequin. So what this actually comes down to in my world is that information is key. We, as large-scale fashion retailers, must be able to give correct, accurate, and let's say flowery information to our consumers so that they can make an educated decision about what to buy. And hopefully, in the long run, we can decrease the number of returns. Because returns do not only cost a lot of money. Actually, Clear Returns say, Clear Returns is a UK-based consultancy company, they say that in the UK alone, the handling of the returns for online retailers cost 23 billion euros per year. That's quite a lot of money, I would say. But it also costs for the ecological footprint that we have. Fashion is already giving a large ecological footprint, but with these returns and the poly bags and all this handling, of course, also contributes to that. Now, why do we have this problem? I also said that we have no real standards, but also the process, and now I come to the purchase to pay process, is extremely error prone. In my view, the purchase to pay process, hence, when we buy the clothes, and then we eventually pay them when we get the invoice. That process hasn't changed since the rise of the Industrial Revolution, I would say. We still do it the same way. So I'm actually going to show you how this is done, and that's why I need this. I'm also going to explain what I'm doing. And actually, this is not really for facts and information. It's actually more to scare you. 
because this is what it looks like. So the purchase to pay process starts with a hopefully happy uh, supplier meeting a hopefully equally happy retailer buyer. So we have got two uh, parties here. They meet in an order appointment. That's where the retailer buyer is going to look at the clothes and say, I want to have this, 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 and this, and these, and these, and these colorways. They go home and manually fill in an order sheet. Now, at this point of time, they have very little information about what the clothes actually have in terms of characteristics. And we certainly do not have any EANs. EANs are these barcodes, you know, that we scan in the, in the supermarket. Now, this order sheet is sent to the supplier as an indication about what we might want to buy. But don't, for a minute, think that that's actually what we are going to buy in the end. Because it depends on what the supplier is actually going to produce. I want to have this white jacket, but they say, no, 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 there are so few people who want to buy it, so we're actually going to just produce the black one. We also need to get sizes from the supplier. Because the sizes, as I said, differ. Even in the European Union, we say that this is a shoe number, well, size 42. It might be size 42 for them, but not for another supplier, because there's no real control here. Even the same shoe from the same brand, produced in two different factories, can have different sizes. They say it's a number 42, but it's actually a 43 or a 41. Yeah. So we get this here. Now, after this, we need to create the article in our systems, because if we don't create them in our systems, we can't show them online, right? But what happens if you already have this article? We bought it a year before. So we need to figure out if we actually did that. That means that we have a model, we have, we have this shirt, and we bought it in white and black last year, so we know that, and we're looking for that. But now they also produce it in blue. So we'd want it to be under the same model. And figure out if we actually had this article the year before is also quite difficult. Because down here, at this point of time, we do not have the barcodes, which are supposed to be unique, which they are not either. So what we need to look at here is the supplier article code. Supplier article code is a combination of different parameters. So it could be model, it can be the colorway, and size. That's how we normally see this when we go and shop something in any kind of shop, right? But this is not how we build them up. Suppliers can decide what they want to do, what they want to use. We have got suppliers who have fabric code, they have wash code, season code, age code or age range, gender, etc. And the season code changes season by season. We can't have the same season code 2017 as we have 2019, right? Which means that it becomes even more complicated. Now, let's say that we actually figure out that we didn't have it, or we believe so, so we create a new article. That's all good. Now we can create a real purchase order, which is sent to the supplier. A purchase order is also normally quite manual work. So everything here is manual. Type, 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 type. And there are changes. So this process can go on for quite some time. Normally, a purchase order is changed three to four times when we buy. We also need to get more information from the suppliers. So we send them an Excel sheet. That's at least standard for getting article master data. And hopefully here we can also get the EANs, the barcodes, if the supplier actually used them, which a lot of suppliers do not do, because the fashion industry is extreme, extremely um, diversified. You have got suppliers with just two to three employees sitting in a basement somewhere, and then you've got large-scale corporations like Arcadia and VF Group, etc. So if they don't have EANs, we have a real problem in the end. Because we create then the EANs, for them and give them to them. Do you think they save these EANs in some kind of system? No, they don't, because why should they? They have got 500 retailers buying their articles. They are not going to save 500 different EAN codes in their systems to have a unique one. 
But we need them when we get the delivery, because otherwise we can't take the things into the warehouse. And we need them when we get the invoice, because we really need to know what, what is on that invoice, right? So that's another problem down the line. Now, <laughs> let's say that the PO has actually been confirmed. All good. We wait for delivery. But we also need to get samples. Hence, get samples of the articles that we are going to buy, but we want to have them before we actually get the ordinary delivery, because we want to be able to produce these, um, these articles in our system. When I say produce, I do not mean that we actually create the clothes, but we want to produce them for content, so we can actually sell them again, giving customers a good opportunity to see what is this actually about, do I really want to buy this? So we are waiting them for samples. Let's say that they send us samples. Then we can start a content creation. In content creation, we very, very often figure out that the sample does not correspond to the information we got in the article master data sheet. Very often, it's actually the, the material composition that we do not have, or it's not correct. So let's say we have got a jacket, a denim jacket, beautiful denim, 100%. When it comes to content creation, we've got a sample. We see that, no, there's some patches over here. What are they? We need to know. We can't sell it otherwise. You would be surprised how often not even the suppliers know what material they have got in their clothes. I have heard examples of a pair of swim shorts that couldn't go online for over a year because the supplier didn't know what the material was, all the material in it. <laughs> and of course, if we do not get samples, because sample rate is not super high, let's say not around 60% maybe, so 40% or something around there we need to produce when we actually get the real delivery into the warehouse. Two problems there. We lose a window of opportunity to sell it, and so does the, the supplier, of course, because they want to sell their clothes as soon as it actually can hit the market. But if we can't sell it because we don't have the information, we can't. And if we then have a problem with the real delivery not corresponding to what we had in the article master data sheet again, then we have a new waiting period, etc. So what you see here is something that is extremely manual, and I saw something out here. Do not let the human do what a machine can do, I think it said on one of the, uh, one of the booths up here. But that's what we do. We are manually handling everything. And you know how easy it is to completely mess up a 10-digit code of something that you might definitely mix some numbers or some figures around there. And this creates a very big problem. And it also means that we very often sell something to us, well, we, the fashion industry and all, right? We sell something to a consumer which we believe is the correct product. But because of EANs changing from season to season, we may actually sell the, 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 the wrong stuff or send the wrong stuff, which also then contributes to the returns. Now, so to conclude, the process is very tedious, time-consuming, and very, very error-prone. And we have no real standards. And without standards, you cannot automate. And as I said, I think this comes from the fact that we haven't really changed this process since the Industrial Revolution. So what has happened is that we have got an offline process, and an offline process does not need automation. And if you do not need automation, you do not need standards. And that means that it becomes even more or increasingly difficult to actually create automation, which means that we stay in an offline world. So what can we do about this then? Well, my belief is that the change must come from the large-scale retailers like, like Zalando because we can put pressure on our suppliers to a certain extent, but we are also like a focal point for a lot of suppliers. Um, and non-automation also comes with a huge cost. I can give you an example. Whoop, yep, that worked. <laughs> Let's say that you have got 
um, 2,000 suppliers, you have got 10 different warehouses. You want to have three delivery windows, because we do not want to receive 20,000 pairs of the same jeans at the same time in the warehouse. We want to receive them in waves. So we want to have three delivery splits. And that's just for the pre-order, hence, before a season has started. Then we also got to reorder, etc. This means that the total number of orders that we would send out with, with this setting could easily be 200,000 orders. Invoicing is normally based on what we get delivered, and since deliverers can also be split up because they say, yes, we want to sell these 200 jeans to you, but we can only send 150 today and we send 50 tomorrow, this can easily then amount to 400k invoices. Now, this comes with a cost. So this is orders, and this is invoice. GS1 Germany has calculated the cost for this, for handling this, this offline, manually. The cost for handling orders is 12, 12 euros per order. The cost for handling invoices is 16 euros per invoice on both sides, both for the supplier and for the retailer, so in total. This amounts to 9 million euros almost. Now, let's say that the split is 50-50, and I can tell you, if I could contribute to Salando saving 4.5 million euros in a year, I would gladly do so by automation. So not doing automation actually comes with a cost. So what do we need to do as a large-scale retailer to help our suppliers to improve both our processes? Well, we need to open up the door as wide as possible for this multitude of different suppliers with different capabilities. And we have a few things we can actually play around with here. We need to also streamline our own internal processes. And we need to have business rules in place so that the information that we eventually automatically can receive from the suppliers actually can flow into the correct bucket of information, so to speak, in our internal systems. So what we can do is, for small suppliers, or suppliers who completely lack EDI capabilities, EDI, you know what that is, to transfer data between two different parties with message types. So what we did is we created web solutions. Our suppliers can now upload their invoices in a web portal that we have created. That means a little bit of work for them, but it really helps on our side. And we have actually gone, in a very short period of time, just about two years, we have gone from basically, well, almost, 0% automated invoices to 84%. I think that is, that, is, that is quite a good number. And the majority of the invoices that we actually get through the automated channels, no human needs to look at them at all. We can pay them automatically because we have controls and checks in place. So web solutions is one thing, but that will only cover the small suppliers, because if you are a supplier who needs to send us 100 invoices per week, I doubt you want to do it that way. So we also need to work with EDI. So EDI, which is a standard. Um, so we have direct EDI with us. But for us to set up a direct EDI connection with 1,000 suppliers is a lot of work, and it needs to be maintained. So we also introduce third-party EDI. There are a lot of companies out there who work with helping connecting suppliers uh, with retailers in order to to facilitate the automation. They have got a Klondike period right now, I can tell you. 
we actually chose to go, to go um, exclusively with one. And we have had quite a lot of pushback from our suppliers to say, we already have got the third party integrator we work with, why should we work with yours? The reason is that if we would say we can integrate with any kind of third party provider, we would see, soon have as many connections to them as we would have to our individual uh, suppliers. We can't handle that, it's impossible. <laughs> when it came to EDI, and I'm talking about invoices now because we actually started with invoices, which is the wrong way to go, in my opinion. If you really want to do this the correct way, you should actually go a little bit of a different way. I'm going to tell you that. Um, here we have today around 60 to 70 suppliers who are direct integration with us. And in just six months, through the third party integrator, we went from zero to 166 suppliers integrated. So that was really something that helped us reach these numbers, because we're talking about the biggest suppliers here who stands for a large chunk of our transactions, right? I'm almost out of time, I see. Um, so what could we have done better? Well, this is a process, and as a process, it has different steps, and these steps should come in a certain order in order to give the best leverage for us. So what we should have done is to start with, and I'm using the EDI language here, but I will explain what it is. We should have started with PriCat. PriCat is a price catalog, contains very little information about the articles, but we know what article it is, and we know what price it has, and we know, hopefully, what uh, EAN is there as well, if we are really lucky. Now, well, we should actually know that because Pricat doesn't really work without EAN, so that's a, this, that's a different discussion. Now, when we know what articles we have, we can actually raise an order. Or there. When we have raised an order, we can actually get an order response. Now, if we get an order response, we can presume that something is going to get delivered. So then we are going to get a delivery notification. And this other way. And eventually we will get an invoice. Now, there are different message types that can be used here as well. So why should we have done it in these steps? Why is that recommendable? In most cases, it's recommendable because the pricket is the foundation for the order. The order is, of course, the foundation for the order response. And the order response is the foundation for the delivery notification, so we actually know that we are going to get the stuff delivered to our warehouses. And the invoice needs to be checked against all of these. If we can check that the invoice corresponds to what we have in terms of prices here, that the order was correct, or at least the order response was correct, and it was also delivered. That means that you can also automate also that piece in the whole process. And hence, you gain automation across the board. But it is very important when you start to work with this that you really think about how your processes look, what information you need at what kind, in what point of time regarding your articles, and how you can get more information in earlier. The earlier you have the information around the articles that you might want to buy, the more you can also automate the earlier stages here. Why fill in an order sheet by hand if you already could know back here what the articles are and what articles number they have, and you can let that flow into your systems? And I have got four minutes left and nothing more to say, so thank you very much for listening. <laughs>